Hello and welcome to the Gifted Podcast. I am your host Neeraj Mulani and in the Gifted Podcast I speak with elite athletes as we try to challenge the misconception that athletes are just some people who are talented or gifted with special abilities at birth. Every week I am joined by an elite athlete as we try to break down what it truly takes and means to be an athlete. If you are an aspiring athlete or just a casual sports fan, you will definitely enjoy this podcast as I get candid with athletes about their journey, their achievements, moments of heartbreak and most importantly, moments of hard work and perseverance. Today, I have with me Latvian track and field athlete who competes in the sport of pole vaulting, Pauls Pujats. Pauls is an Olympian and competed at the 2016 Rio Olympics where he was a finalist and finished 12th overall. Since Pauls is the first pole vaulter on my podcast, I try and understand the physiology of an ideal pole vaulter and the basics of the sport. Among other things, we also discuss how the pandemic forced postponement has disrupted his training for the Tokyo Olympics. So, let's jump right in. Welcome to the Gifted Podcast Pauls. We're really really excited to have you today. How are you doing? Thank you, Niraj. Appreciate it. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. <laughs> How are you, Niraj? All all good, man. All good. And you're the first Paul Walter on the podcast, so I would definitely want to pick your brains on the basics of the sport because I do love learning about new sports and the only knowledge I have of pole vaulting is from the 8 bit video games that I had played as a child so would you be kind enough to tell the audience and myself what are the basics involved in pole vaulting and what are the common rules that athletes should be aware of and also physiologically what constitutes an ideal pole vaulter mm-hmm. absolutely so starting from the head start i would say pole vaulting is extremely complicated sport so not only you have to be mentally strong but also physically strong fast uh, agile and and also with good reflexes um because you never know what can happen and you have to be very brave very courageous as well imagine running with a with a huge stick in your hands and planting in the ground and then lifting yourself off over it takes a lot of mechanics there and a lot of engineering too so it really helps if you have someone who knows knows uh like the whole physics behind of it that really helps too and a, and a good coach good coach is not only there to coach you but also to be there almost like a your lucky charm who mentors you helps you you know is there for the support yeah, that's just an in a glimpse of what is pole vaulting and w- what would you say constitutes an ideal pole vaulter physiologically would somebody like you who's really tall have an advantage or you know like we see in horse riding shorter people of shorter heights have an advantage mm-hmm. what would you say are the physical constituents of ideal pole vaulters you know interestingly i've seen many pole vaulters different sizes has seen um, who are smaller than me uh, some who are taller you do have an advantage when you are taller because you're able to take off higher and it's just much more easier to go through the vertical that is advantage for sure if you're bigger if you're taller but honestly you have to be light you can't be massive you know you can be a sumo wrestler <laughs> you have to be light or body go there you have to be pretty light but uh at the same time very strong because you have to hold you know imagine you have to hold yourself on on a pole that's moving full speed so yeah different bodies but i'd say the taller you are kind of the more you can be almost like a gym, gymnast you know be in very control in your body that's amazing quality to have so would you say having say an an experience of multiple sports as a child would be advantages to a pole vaulter because they have to develop various different aspects of athletics within their body because it's not a skill that comes naturally to everybody and you know it's a obviously mm-hmm. a specialized and acquired skill of pole vaulting yeah if you can in your early childhood I, i highly recommend to do all sorts of sports especially gymnastics honestly gymnastics and uh something with kung fu, kung fu is amazing because they develop your body in early age to be very dynamic very flexible and strong at the same time also 
something for adrenaline, I highly recommend to do like skateboarding, snowboarding, maybe surfing and uh, cliff diving to get that adrenaline rush too. So that combination would be amazing together. And a little bit of cross country because cross country gets to develop the stamina that you can, you know, longer last in the, in the jumps. Right. So which sports would you say you used to play as a child? I did skateboarding, snowboarding. <laughs> I did also decathlon. Decathlon is amazing too. So there's 10 events that you have to do. And um, I did uh, Taekwondo as well, a little bit of Taekwondo and, and a little bit of gymnastics. Well, actually gymnastics started when I was a teenager already. So gymnastics were a little bit later for me, but yeah, the right. sports that I, oh, and swimming, swimming and, and a little bit of uh, long distance running. <laughs> So amongst so. all these sports that you were doing, and like you mentioned also decathlon and being so good at multiple sports, why would you say you ended up choosing pole vaulting as your specialized sport? I got to say, I honestly just followed my brother's footsteps. <laughs> he's older brother and I was literally just doing whatever he's doing, <laughs> just following him. <laughs> and then later on, I just get better and better with time. That's it. <laughs> Pretty much straightforward how it is. And obviously I liked it too. And Let's talk about so far the highlight of your career in pole vaulting, which is the Rio Olympics. Please talk me through the Rio experience, the qualification that got you there and also the overall Olympics. How, how did that go for you and what were your feeling going into the Olympics? Yeah. So I guess the dream came you know, true when I qualified for Rio Olympics. Uh, while I was still trying to qualify, I don't know, it was... It was still, I felt, even when I went to college uh, with a really good result, I felt like it's such a long way to go. Like it's, it's almost like impossible to reach. Very, very huge, you know, amount of effort you have to put in. Energy and luck. A lot of it is luck. Uh, because you don't know, uh, each individual has its own unique skill sets. Some people might have just a natural talent. You know, they really effortlessly achieve the things that they achieve. And it comes easier for them. Um, for some people, you have to put in immense hard hard work, a lot of work uh, to achieve the same level or even go into that level. And I'm one of the people who I don't really had uh, much of a talent except for my height. I was very blessed with the, with my, with the tall body <laughs> and uh, a very strong perseverance. So I had a very strong willpower and then a very, very focused mind of what it is what I want to do. So I was blessed with that. But the rest of it, I needed to put a lot, a lot of work in that. And uh, I would say that kind of drained me out quite a bit. But then I finally got the qualification mark and I was able to go to Rio Olympics when, when that came true, when I understood like I qualified for them. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, and then when I went to Rio Olympics, it was a dream come true. It was amazing uh, experience, feeling. And um, yeah. Just something that I think I can, uh, you know, carry on for the rest of my life and and and, <laughs> and uh, share share that with other people, share that experience with other people as well. So going into Rio, knowing that you have qualified for for it now, what sort of goals were you setting for yourself going into Rio, and also how were you training physically as well as mentally for the Olympics? So obviously, when I went there, you know. The goal is to win, you know, it's always to win. It's, it's not like uh, just to compete, just to compete. You know, I, I always went there just to, to really fight for the best ones. You know, it's, a, it's like the prehistoric gladiator games. You, you got to survive there. <laughs> but the fight was only with myself. I always wanted to beat my own, my own records. It was never with anyone else. I, if I knew I can beat myself, I can be better myself. That's, that's already accomplished goal. A lot of meditation. A lot of focus on that. That was uh, actually in yogic practices, opening up a lot of energies, chakras, as well as focusing the mind with the words of affirmation, and then all the physical aspect to it, which is a lot. You know, from weight rooms to tempo runs to pole vaulting, uh, gymnastics, and other unique exercises, so, yeah. and recovery. Definitely recovery. If you want to be a highest level, there is you got to make choices that's going to limit the things that you want to do. You can't do it all. So if you want to be a highest level athlete, you can't be working. 
you got to focus on sleeping, training, eating, resting, recovering. That's it. That's all you can see. Unfortunately, it's very limited. If you're if you're not, if you're not especially if you're not talented. If you're talented, you can maybe uh, and if you're quick, you're fast. You know, you can afford to do here and there a little bit something else. Yeah, and uh, something that you mentioned right now, and I'd love to dig deeper on that, which is relying on alternative methods like yoga, like meditation, you know, energy science, trying to open up the chakras. We don't really often hear many athletes talk about these things. It's often the physical training aspect that comes about in the discussion when they are talking about their preparation going into Olympics. But we know that at such an elite level, physical training and physiological attributes are rarely and rarely a differentiating factor. So how did you get into these alternative ways of trying to get yourself in the right mindset and how did you use them to your advantage? Uh, I'm going to start from the beginning that, you know, it's very true that not many people actually uh, know about these techniques, know about these practices. And it's important, you know, to have right mentors, right teachers who actually know what they're doing and want you, you know, to get have the, the best best possible uh, accessible information that you can possibly possess. So again, I don't have I didn't have much of a talent. So I needed to find an extra resource how I can you know substitute myself to be better you know to improve myself to get better higher level with the things that I have already at my at my uh, advantage. And I was lucky that I have uh, from Buddhist monks showed me. Uh, unique breathing techniques to yogic masters who showed me mudras, yogic asanas, and uh, also unique breathing techniques, how to recover the body, how to open up any energy blockages that I might have, and also how to train the mind, how to train the focus. That involved hours of meditation, of course, hours of yogic stretches and then asanas, and um, a little bit also some, some other unique, unique approaches. Uh, that I'll probably mention later on, uh, like standing on nails, <laughs> you know, I can show you a video right now. That's something for training the mind, training the focus there, you know, your goals and vision. And uh, some were also standing on the, on the glass, but you have to be with an expert, you know, to do all of that stuff. Uh, so just, just a little bit of that, just something to train the mind a little bit farther. And this is all really insightful to, especially for aspiring athletes who know that there are such techniques to also rely on to get that additional advantage at the field. I was keen to understand what sort of interactions would you be having with yourself and also trying to get into the right kind of mindset before the Olympics. So all these techniques that have been picked, picked upon, uh, one thing that I want to mention is that uh, it's amazing when you have that opportunity to do, to try these things, you know, to see how they work for you. And this is why I actually offered, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Airbnb experiences and my website as well, uh, all these uh, practices so other people can try them. You know, other people can actually use them because that's the goal. We want to take care of each other, right? We want to help one another. And uh, yeah, before the Olympics, all of all of that was in uh, all those practices, particularly for athletics. Um, those were some unique green techniques. Uh, also meditation, visualization, it's almost like a law of attraction that I was doing. I think it's very important to have the right mindset, have a very vibration to do that. Right. And apart from meditation and yoga and visualization as well, you're also a martial arts expert and one of the only two certified mm -hmm. instructors of the warfare combat system in the US. How did these alternative techniques physiologically also come to your advantage on your way to becoming a better pole vaulter? So I think it's important to try different sports for everyone. That is for everyone. Take what you can implement it in your sport from other sports. Absolutely. That's just a benefit for anyone. Try out many things and you'll see, you'll learn so much more. And if needed, you can adjust it to your specific sport to your advantage. I think it's, it's very important to be open-minded for everything. And then, right. War for a combat system came with uh, some unique exercises of how also there was meditation, 
and some unique exercise how you can strengthen the body even further on it's it's very amazing very awesome and having all these techniques to your advantage you went into the rio olympics i'd love to hear your uh, how did you train the day before the olympics how did your heats go and then finally the, the final jump yeah so it's a little bit more complex when it comes to the competition and training it's two different types of approaches before rio uh before any competition actually usually one day before you'll do a light jog some sprint drills and a little bit of stretching that's it nothing more that's all you need to do and uh you just rest the entire time focus on the competition accumulate that energy focus meditate you know accumulate that energy charge yourself up so yeah that's that's pretty much how it is and i think uh, for any competition you need to be very well rested yeah, recovered <laughs> right and how did that then help you perform better in your qualifying jumps and then also on your way to the final jumps you definitely qualified for that and ended up finishing 12th how did you manage your mindset throughout these jumps and how did you rate your own performance at the at the end of the olympics so since these were my first olympics i was um, you know new experiences so to say <laughs> something that i haven't experienced before and uh, when i went to qualification i just had fun honestly i went there in the mindset without being too i mean i was serious i wanted to i know what i wanted to do accomplish but i went there with the mindset you know just enjoy this moment just to have fun and i think in the qualification mark i had uh, too much fun <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, i kind of like put everything out because i really wanted to qualify i mean i really wanted to go further you know that was i guess i perhaps i limited myself even it's very possible i were i spit spit myself all out in in, in the first uh, qualification mark and uh just the next day i couldn't really sleep because i was too excited i was too too uh too on the round up uh rounded up and then the the final there were some bad uh weather conditions and uh and i had a little trouble jumping in the rain uh mentally mentally it was challenging for me and uh yeah didn't didn't well, didn't want to too well as 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 much as i expected I felt great actually in the competition I felt great it was all but again if you're mentally not ready then everything else is not going to fall fall with you yeah. right <laughs> and I think this is really interesting that you mentioned here where since this was your first olympics you were obviously excited and went all out in your qualifying jumps itself and this is something that I recently read as well in Uh, in abhinav bindra's book who's actually a rifle gold medalist in Be- from beijing um, and he's an indian rifle shooter he mentions how he realized in his first olympics in sydney and also in athens that he cannot sleep the night before the the shooting finals are going to happen which is why after the athens olympics all the world championships that happened he force himself to stay awake and train himself to perform better even without sleeping on the day of the finals which is what actually helped him perform really well in beijing he he mentions in his book that that he only ended up sleeping about 2 hours the night but he really woke up afresh and was ready to go and got into the trance zone so i think it, it's really interesting to also then see that evolution go through like you mentioned everybody even at the elite level if it is the first olympics they need to go through that that process of the experience to eventually reach that absolutely because all of it is just the mind all of it is if you can calm the mind you'll be good <laughs> if only that, if only it was that easy right <laughs> that's the <another> thing <laughs> very true very true and going back to actually before the olympics and i'm keen to understand how did you grow as a pole vaulter while you were studying in the us and what sort of cultural differences were there while you were competing in latvia compared to competing in the us 
Yeah, that's a good question because it's a huge difference. Uh, when I was competing training in Latvia and studying Latvia too, uh, I got to say, you never really experience the support from your teammates, from your fans, uh, as much as you experience it in, in, in the United States. I don't know why I experienced such a huge change. And um, like your teammates in the University of Memphis were so cheerful, always cheering you on. And, you know, we, ha we did this to each other. It was, it was shock for me. I couldn't understand, like, why are you cheering so much for me? Like, why are you, like, you know, yelling my name and, like, cheering on? It was a shock for me. You know, the Latvians would never do something like that. <laughs> you would never experience anything like that. <laughs> And it was a very, very shocking, very, very strange at first. But honestly, that gave so much more power, so much more confidence. It's crazy. I wish every, every nation had like this, an obligation where you literally cheer one another, you know, because you are literally, literally on this world with one another, you have to cheer yourself on. And I think when you cheer on even your competitors, uh, you understand that they're not any, anymore your competitors. They're more so of like your another team teammate that's you know that you're competing with and, and, and just having fun with enjoying the process uh, it's a big one that's a big 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 change big change for sure <laughs> and we often see a lot of track and field athletes who have their own way of getting their psych on if i could call it that sometimes we see there are like two kinds of athletes one who would try and shut everything out and just listen in on themselves and the complete contrast are the, are the ones who try to psych the audience up and use that energy to perform better in those events what kind of athlete would you say you are it depends actually it depends on the mood sometimes i i, I get get the crowd cheering up and uh, sometimes i'm just focused on what i need to do um, i will say this there it's really very really true that a lot of athletes are different some people like to be cheered on. Some people like to be kind of introverted and focus on their own thing. And I think there's a big, big difference on what, how is the individual, you know, on the, each individual, has, how is unique uniqueness is. Because uh, some people waste a lot of energy when they have a lot of people or it's a distraction. And some people get energy from that. It really depends on each individual. It's a, it's a big difference. Yeah. It, it depends on my mood. <laughs> Which one would be that jump that you say has been your best or the most stand out jump for you? It may not be the Olympic jump uh, itself, but which one do you say has really got you excited yourself about your own jump? You know, I'll say that the biggest change that has uh, given in my life was the qualification jump that I did. And I think that kind of left in my memory, like, wow, you know, you've, you've done this, you made it. <laughs> and then Rio Olympic Games competition as also was really, really fun. It was, uh, it was just a fun experience. <laughs> but I got to say, uh, there's one practice that it was in summer time a couple of years ago when uh, I, I've done something that I didn't do, didn't, couldn't be able to done before. And uh, I think that was an amazing moment in my life when I, when I could, could take the biggest poles, the highest grips, and just don't give a damn at all about anything. <laughs> and it was just having fun. It was, it was amazing. Like, it was a huge immense of power that you have in that motion, in that moment. But it doesn't come, uh, it didn't came uh, later on for some reason. It came with a, a huge immense of uh, pushing myself to get hyped up. Before that, it just happened, you know, naturally. Now, this is where the talent comes in as well. If the person is talented, it comes naturally for them. It just not comes naturally. They don't have to think about it. Uh, for some, you literally need to almost an unlock yourself, like a new new ability. Those are the three main 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 ones, <laughs> I guess, that left left the most impression on me. Yeah, and I think that's really intriguing to know because you know that your body and mind are capable of jumps like that, especially if they're happening in training. And then you're trying to learn how do you replicate that? And what sort of zone do you need to get your body and mind into to be able to perform at such a level? But the more you try to get into that zone, the farther it goes away from you. 
Yeah, the more you think about it, the the, the more distraction you're gonna get. Yeah, you can't overthink. In that sport, you literally can't overthink. It has to come naturally to you. And knowing that obviously the qualification jump and the jumps at the Olymp- Olympics really had you excited. I was keen to know what would you say were your learnings from the Rio experience? Good one. With one answer, I would say in, enjoy every moment that is given to you without waiting for something unique to happen in your life. I think, you know, real Olympic Games really doesn't come often. You know, I mean, Olympic Games in general don't, don't come often, right? And you have such a small amount to, to, to get into it. Uh, such a small chance to get into it and then actually compete there and compete good. That's also another one. And I think it's important for people, they wait until this one unique moment. They work, work, work until this one unique moment. They forgot to enjoy the process. That's why it's important, important, very important to enjoy every single thing that's given to you because life is a gift. Every moment is a gift. You got to enjoy it, have to enjoy it. Absolutely. And then I think you'll be able to really appreciate and celebrate every given moment to you without expecting something to happen in the future wise, because you never know what's going to happen in the future. Life is a mystery and it, it's not guaranteed for everyone. So have to be very aware of that to understand it, to enjoy the moment, enjoy the process. And Right after the Olympics as well, you ended up actually writing and releasing a book of your own, Healthy Food for Athletes. What were your aspirations behind writing this book? I had many people who were asking me, what's my diet? (laughs) And I decided, okay, you know what? Instead of me, like always telling every every single person, I'm just going to write a book and just, you know, get it out there so people can just read it. That was my biggest aspiration, honestly. <laughs> so I could save some some of my, my voice. <laughs> and having that learning and experience process throughout the, the Rio Olympics as well, and like you mentioned, being able to enjoy that process as well and not just be worried about the final outcome. It's heartening to actually see see you hold that perspective of gratitude still in spite of the delay and postponement of the Tokyo Olympics that has, you know, disrupted your training schedule. How, how are you able to manage through this uncertain time, especially knowing that, you know, athletes across the world are affected by this? Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's why uh, I think it's important to really enjoy every moment that's given to you. Nothing is granted, you know, nothing's, <clears throat> nothing's for sure. And uh, things change. You just need to adapt to them. With all the global pandemic, everyone's in it. Not just like you and me, you know, <laughs> everyone's in it. <laughs> that's why you got to adapt and adapt, accept and move on. That's all we can do, right? and get the best what we can out of everything that's given to us. I think it's always, a, it's, it's a remedy for a, for a happy life, for a happy, peaceful life. <laughs> Maybe it's not going to be peaceful all the time, you know, but uh, it's definitely for more, more understanding, more, more, more calmer. So to say with your mind, like uh, understanding why things happen, you know? Yeah. And like I said, it's really heartening. And I think, it would obviously be difficult to, in spite of going through four, five years of preparation for the Olympics and still not knowing whether it is going to happen, how it is going to happen, and still being able to hold that perspective, it's really awe-inspiring. That's why it's good to have a hobby. You know, if polo thing isn't your hobby already, then it's good to have something else that you can do on the side. I think it's, uh, you know, not, not like a plan B, but something that you would like to do futuristic wise, I think it's important to have that thing. Otherwise you'll be lost. You don't know what to do. You'll be very confused and, uh, and, and not in a good mood at all. That's why it's important to have a certain other thing. I have my, my, uh, my website and my experiences that I give to people, which I just love, you know, if, uh, you know, pull things out of their life, then, you know, 
my experiences with trigger point therapy, mindful yoga, and uh, meditation, strength and conditioning. I love to do it. It's it's enjoyable. It's it's amazing to give a good value to people through that. So yeah. Right. And would you say those are also the paths that you'd want to explore further once you have retired from pole vaulting, or are there any other future aspirations that you have in mind once you have retired? Uh, I think I have many goals. I have many, uh, many things that I want to do, but this is something I'm, I'm already doing. You know, my, my, my sessions, my online sessions are already accessible to everyone. So I'd love to do that already. Uh, they're just another things that go with it, almost like a, a transferring phase. And they just combine with one another amazingly, really good. There are a lot of them, but uh, it, it, they're connected with one another. I'm definitely going to share more when the when they come to realization. And I do see a, a really good trait and trend of being a decathlon, decathlon athlete where mm-hmm. why play just one sport when you can, you know, be better in 10 sports at a time, which is, which is what I see you doing with, you know, not just being good at pole vaulting, but there are various other things that, you know, you aspire to become better at. And that, that, that's really, really inspiring. Absolutely. I think that's amazing, you know, to, to have a diversity, try, try out many things as you possibly can. You never know what you like, what you're good at. It's very important to try many, many things. I would personally really wish to send you my best wishes for your preparation for Tokyo and not just a successful Olympics, but also a safe Olympics for you. And I'd love to then also post the Olympics possibly have the chance to then have you again and discuss your gold medal winning jump. (laughs) Thank you, Nanash. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I wish you, I wish you immense success, health. First of all, health. That's the most important one. (laughs) Uh, Health and an amazing success in everything that you set your mind to. And I I, I think it's amazing that you do these interviews with, with, uh, Diverse people in different sports. It's amazing. Yeah. To have that in, introspective for other people and to have uh, literally giving them a, a new information, a new source of inspiration, perhaps, or a new source of uh, knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much for taking other time today, Paul. I really, really appreciate it. It was a real pleasure having you today. My pleasure, Nirad. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, It's always intriguing to see athletes from different backgrounds and using alternative techniques like meditation and yoga to gain that extra boost in their performance. And Pauls has been such a big advocate of these methods and has also been teaching the same to masses through his partnership with Airbnb. He is wishing Pauls a very safe and successful Tokyo Olympics. So that's it for this episode folks. Thank you for tuning into the Gifted Podcast. I have been your host Neeraj Mulani. A gentle reminder, you can find us as The Gifted on your favorite podcast platforms including Apple, Spotify and Google. Keep following us on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube as The Gifted Podcast and on Twitter as The Gifted Pod so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thank you once again for listening and I'll see you next week with another special episode. Until then, stay well and keep your masks on.